you, Lina, for hosting this event. And this is Zhen Xiao, I'm from Uber, and today uh, I'm very happy to talk about real-time analytics at Uber. Mostly we are running real-time analytics on heterogeneous data. So since the time is quite limited, so I try to be, uh, do not cover most of the details, just uh, cover the uh, agenda and some of the objections. So the problem we are defining is uh, every big company, we have data everywhere. And we found that data copy is pretty expensive. And uh, for example, at Uber, we have hundreds or even thousands of data copy happening every day. And so cost of hours of latency for the uh, data to be queryable. Then we want to follow the principle that moving computation is much cheaper than moving data, since data copy is always costing you know, CPU, time and networking bandwidth and memory and so many things. Well, moving the computation is like your program to move to the data. That is much cheaper. And then finally, I will try to introduce uh, Presto, which is an interactive SQL on everything. And then introduce a concept called Presto Connectors, where you can run just SQL on everything. Uh, two examples for our recent work is the Presto Elasticsearch Connector and Presto Pino Connector, where you can run SQL directly on Elasticsearch, no need to copy the data. Or you run SQL directly on Pino, and no need to copy the data. Yeah, so the first about the problem is uh, at Uber, we have data everywhere. We have a huge amount of data. And uh, uh, another interesting problem is the data is not stored in one single text stack. For example, it's not everything in Hadoop. We also have data in MySQL, in Postgres, in Vertica. Uh, for the real-time side, we have data in Jude, in Pino, in Elasticsearch. Also, we have data out the events in Kafka and uh, <clears throat> a number of chips in Cassandra and many other tech stack. So, so we have a huge amount of data and they're storing a heterogeneous data stack. So it's uh, data everywhere. Another thing we found interesting is uh, data copy is quite expensive. Since every day we are running so many jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, uh, what are they doing? They are either dumping data from MySQL to Hadoop all uh, their load data from Hadoop to Vertica, dumping data from Elasticsearch to Hadoop, copy data from Hadoop to Cassandra, or dump data from Kafka to Hadoop. All many, many other similar things. Just copy the data from one data source to another one. And usually this copy will cost CPU time, memory, and also networking bandwidth. And the latency for this data copy, usually it is hours, if not days. Sometimes it could be days. Uh, if during the data copy you have any problem, you have to backfill the data, that will trigger a much more important incident or outage to the whole company. So mm -hmm. this is really hard to maintain, but I run how to do this uh, almost every day. This is a pain point. So the philosophy we already had is uh, one big data, this concept was born. Uh, in the original uh, philosophy, we are thinking that moving computation is much cheaper than moving data because data copy is very expensive. But moving the computation, that is something we can control in our software. So we want to follow this principle to do something smarter. So let me introduce this project we are doing for almost four years. It's called Presto. Presto is an interactive SQL engine for big data. And it has an interactive query speeds usually uh, in the order of seconds or at most in the order of minutes. And Presto is horizontally scale. For example, if you have a 200 machine Presto cluster, then you plug in another 300 machines, you uh, immediately you get 500 machine cluster. Presto supports uh, standard IC SQL. So all the, uh, it's very standardized and everyone knows SQL. Also Presto is usually uh, created by Facebook engineers, and now uh, a large number of companies are using Presto at very large scale. For example, the Facebook, Twitter, Uber, LinkedIn, Netflix, Airbnb, and so many others. And uh, as far as I know, all the companies, either they have uh, several hundreds nodes cluster, or they have thousands of nodes cluster. On Facebook, I think they have uh, hundreds of thousands of machines. Uh, many clusters running the production jobs. So uh, uh, reliability and quality is very good. Also, Presto is completely open source. You can track the uh, uh, open source version. You can contribute code there. You can get all the uh, patches or contributions from all the other contributors. So it's easy for anyone to uh, catch up. Also, Presto has this nice feature, which I will emphasize on. 
is can access to petabytes of data, not only in Hadoop, but also in other storage stack. For example, at Uber, we're using uh, Presto on Elasticsearch, Presto on Druid, Presto on Pino, and a number of things. Yeah, here is uh, <coughs> some technical details about how Presto works. It is a uh, typical database staff. In each cluster, we have one coordinator which is doing compile SQL into tasks. And then all the other machines are workers. Some of the workers, they are doing table scan. So they may stream data from Hadoop, or stream data from Elasticsearch, or Pino, or MySQL, or any data source. And then some of the worker threads are running aggregation, the SQL uh, operations, for example, the final aggregations, the by the joins, and window functions, all the things. And then the client just sends the SQL to coordinator, coordinator after doing the analyzing, planning, fragmenting. And then the scheduler will schedule all the tasks running on workers, and finally, the result will be uh, streamed back to the client. This is, uh, uh, in general, how Presto works. Uh, here is some details about the scale of Presto. At Uber, Uber, we have two data centers running, each of them running four clusters. And for uh, business critical use cases, we have a dedicated cluster for them. For example, we have hundreds of machines just for the, a few important customers. And then we are supporting a P90 under 20 seconds, and that is supporting more than 120,000 queries per day. Also, in each of the data center, we have one shared ad hoc cluster, which also consists of hundreds of machines and supporting more than 80K queries per day. Yeah, I will omit uh, the other details, just uh, you can come to the talk when we have the data conference. And one nice feature for Presto is these uh, Presto connectors where you no need to copy data. Uh, for example, in this graph, you can see that you can run Presto uh, SQL directly on MySQL or Hadoop or Kafka, Elasticsearch, or anything. You no need to copy data, let's say, from uh, MySQL to Hadoop. Then you use a uh, high or Spark to query them. You just directly, you can use Presto MySQL connector to query directly there. Another nice feature is you can even draw in tables from different data sources. For example, it's easy for you to draw in data between Hadoop and Elasticsearch, and no data copy, or you can draw in data between Elasticsearch and Kafka. And then you just uh, do a uh, standard SQL there. So this is a nice feature, which really getting rid of the expensive data copy. Uh, for all the other details, for example, the connector interface, how we implement that, and uh, an example is how we implement this Presto Elasticsearch connector, and also, for the performance improvement we are doing to support that in production scale, all the things will be covered in my talk. So you're well, welcome to come to my talk. And uh, if you're interested, just come to the talk and you can ping me for any questions. Thank you. The, uh, the product recommendation system that we built here at Levi's, uh, Levi's, as you all know, is uh, you know uh, everyone's beloved denim brand and uh, you know, we, we have had a uh, number of years of you know selling products in brick and mortar store, and we recently started selling uh, in just in the last decade. You know our products online, and uh, you know we want to make the experience online as good as it is in the store. And this is really about the journey that we have been taking over the last few years to make the product ex the, the customer experience online um, sort of very seamless, intuitive, and really you know kind of try to mimic the experience that they have when they walk into a store. Um, so, you know, for example, like, you know, a lot of you are using, uh, Spotify, you know, you, you listen to Spotify, uh, and Spotify has this feature called discover weekly, where it uh, creates a, a custom playlist just for you based upon your listening habits and millions of people use it. Billions of songs have been streamed through it. Um, and it's a really great example of how personalization can really create a magical experience for the end, end, end users. Um, Amazon, on the other hand, has a very different take on recommendations and it recommends a lot of products for you and it's really the cornerstone when you think about good recommender systems online. Uh, the metric that Amazon sort of released was that 30% of its page views come from its internal recommendations. And you know what that has done is that it has created this ex uh, expectation amongst customers when they're shopping online or just browsing online to get a really high quality personalized experience but the reality is actually quite far from, from that, where Bizarre Voice did this survey 
uh, last year, and they asked people about, uh, you know, whether, you know, how many of them expect uh, to have a personalized homepage. And 44% responded, uh, you know, in the positive. Uh, but when they asked how many of them actually experienced a personalized homepage, only 23% said that they had. And you can see there's a pretty large gap there. And uh, what that does is that what complicates things a little bit further is the fact that 38% of the consumers said that they won't return to an online retailer that recommends things that don't make sense for them. So what it means is that it's not just enough to just have a recommender system online. It actually has to be meaningful. Otherwise, we run the chance of pushing our customers away you know, and directly. And so uh, at Levi's, we, we definitely want to be you know, providing the, the experience that consumers expect, but we also want to be providing it in a meaningful way. And that's really the motivation for the recommender system that we built online. And uh, uh, the talk itself, uh, I won't go into all the details, of course, here, but the talk itself is really about how we went through the journey, how we uh, iterated on different architectures to make the, the recommendations real-time and scalable to the traffic that we get, but also how we develop different uh, algorithms that can help us provide that kind of customized, uh, that personalized experience. So one thing that we did was that we tried to understand what are the customer expectations here? And we actually get a lot of feedback from our, uh, from our customers who visit our stores. And we have a feedback box where, and this was just randomly picked from there. And one of the feedback that I think we found was that you know, somebody who visited the website said, or sorry, visited the store said, Tanner was super friendly and helpful. Uh, from the moment we walked in the door, he was very knowledgeable about the different styles and helped me find exactly what I was looking for even though I wasn't expecting to find it. He made the experience so much better and found some amazing pieces. Thank you, Tanner. Just from the amount of exclamation marks in this uh, uh, feed, uh, you know, piece of feedback, you can see how happy and excited the customer was after the experience. And what we really thought was that we want to use this our, as our North Star. We really want to think about how can we create the kinds of recommendations online that would in, you know, elicit the same kinds of enthusiasm from our consumers uh, when they use these recommendations. And so we did a lot of consumer research and studies and uh, we really uh, distilled the, the five most important properties that a good recommender system should have. The first one is that it should make the customer journey intuitive and frictionless. Uh, the second one is that it should really reflect the, the brand's values and communicate you know, what, what we think is really, you know, what, we, what, what we would try to recommend uh, as a brand. So it should really uh, align with you know, the, brand, the brand's voice. It should focus uh, primarily on what consumers want and not on who they are necessarily. Um, so not getting too creepy about trying to get data and whatnot. Um, it should use both implicit behavioral markers and explicit input from the user. And then it should also provide relevant and relevant information in a timely manner to really expedite decision-making. So a recommended system for online, like, uh, for, you know, online, for example, it's not going to be like a, uh, like a pushy, used car salesman who's going to be trying to push products in your face all the time. What happens is that if that, if, if any system tries to do that, you know, people get really turned off by it and they leave the website. So you really want to uh, be more of a concierge and try to provide the information to the end user and give them the right kinds of piece of information that will help them make the decision of what should I buy? What should I buy with this product? What should I buy with that product? Whether should I buy or not, et cetera. So that's really what we kept uh, at the core of our, uh, you know, in our, in our minds when we try, when we try to create uh, the recommendation system. So what I'll do is that I'll actually take you through a quick little live demo of our recommender. So this recommender is live on the website. We are actually running an A-B test. So if you visit the website yourself, you might see slightly different experience, but this is what you would see if you were in the, in the test, um, you know, environment. So let me actually uh, move to a different one. Um, can you still see my screen? Like this is a Levi's page that says future finish on it. Hopefully. Yes, we can see it. We can see it. So this is, I'm visiting the page on an incognito window. So this is when you land on the website and we have no idea who you are. You're a completely new user. Uh, we have never seen your cookie. We don't know who you are. You're not like logged in anything, right? So you, you come into the page, you scroll all the way down on the home page, and you see that it, it says recommended bestsellers. And here we are showing you a mix of products, which are really, you know, best sellers in your region. And so what that does is that, uh, you know, different regions, so different states and different countries in, you know, for example, Europe will have very different preferences in terms of what, 
you know, what kinds of clothings are popular there. So the weather here in California is very different from the weather in, let's say, New Jersey right now. And the, these recommendations will change based upon, you know, where, where your IP sort of locates you to. And so what you see here is that it shows you the most popular fits, um, the most popular items, which are, you know, which are best sellers here. And then as you scroll around, it shows you a mix of men's and women's fits. And this was done in conjunction with our, um, with our customer research and merchandising team to really get to a place of, you know, what are the products that can really start inspiring our consumers when they start shopping? So what we can do now is that let's say I land on the homepage and I like this product, um, this, this jean here, let's say 501 original fit, the classic. I click on it um, um, and then, sorry, it seems like my sharing has been paused. Uh, I see, I see some the pictures we see is $29.50, uh, $59.50. Oh, do you see a 501 original fit jean? Huh? Do you, see, five, do you see a 501 original fit men's jeans? Uh, no. No? It seems like it says my sharing is in pause. Let me stop sharing and then reshare again. Okay, hopefully you can see something. Okay, cool, awesome, yeah. So we landed on this page, you know, we look at it and then we say, oh, this is nice. I go to a different jean. This is a dark stone wash. I go a browse a different jean, you know, different, okay, this is a different jean, cool. Um, and then let's say I go back to the homepage now. So I browse all these jeans. Uh, so just I, I browse three jeans, for example. And now when I scroll down, um, sorry, the page loading is taking a little while. Um, I should, it should uh, generally like what we do is, let me just browse more products maybe. Um, so let's say I go to jeans and I click on this, custom 502. So I think the, the sharing is causing the website to my computer internet to be really slow. But um, anyway, um, let's say I go here for 512. And then I browse different products here, 512. And then I go back to the home page. So now, as you can see, the carousel has changed where it now shows inspired by your shopping. So previously when I was showing, you know, just a mix of men's and women's products, jeans, shirts, whatnot, now it's showing me similar products to what I browse. So I have, you know, 512, the kinds of jeans that I just last browsed, and then uh, 502s, which are similar to uh, what, uh, you know, 502s are also similar to the products that I browse. And so it's now showing me products are similar to what I've been shopping. And this is really designed for helping consumers who maybe browsed around a little bit and then they left the website and they came back again now. So it's showing inspired by your shopping. So now let me add some products to cart, you know, because let's say I click on a product and I think, oh, I like this one. Um, so I'll go in and like, let's say I'll select a size 31, 32, 31, 32, and then I'll add this to bag. So I'll add this to my shopping cart um, and I'll go maybe to a different product. Uh, let's say, um, I'll maybe go, oops, I'll maybe go here. And maybe I'll add a different one to my cart again. 38, 30, whatever, add to bag. And what's happening is that now it's added both these products to cart. And so you can see this is what my shopping cart looks like. I have a 501 jean and I have a 512 jean, which are different types of jeans that we have. I go back to the home page, and now scroll down. So now you can see the recommendations have changed based upon that, based on what I've just added. And I can keep scrolling and you know, it'll, it'll change the recommendations as well. 
And uh, let's say I end up shopping. Let's say I end up purchasing some some products, and uh, you know I, I end up buying something, and then the recommendations will change based upon that as well. And the core idea there is that you want to be able to adapt to the consumer's shopping journey, the stage they're at, and be able to really recommend to them what they are most interested in based upon what they have been shopping. So if I now go back here to the Levi's homepage and scroll all the way down, um, it'll see that the recommendations have also changed now. And so the, the idea is that we want to be able to adapt to the consumer shopping journey. And now let's say if I go back to the, um, and so this is a preloaded uh, homepage. Basically this is my, I've signed in here. So see so I've logged in as myself. And now the recommendation that I'm seeing are very different because it says, because I bought similar styles. And so we adapt that, the recommendations to basically uh, you know, reflect what I've purchased in the past. And I can go to, the, uh, to my orders so that, so you, for example, here, when you go in, you're seeing like a lot of half sleeve, short sleeve shirts and t-shirts in the, in the first part, and then a bunch of jeans in the second part. And then I can go into my account to the order history and what you'll see, okay, let's stop sharing again. Let me share again. So what you'll see here is that in, in the past, what I purchased are a couple of jeans and then a bunch of short sleeve shirts. And so what it does is that it basically learns that, oh, this person is interested tops in t-shirts as well as jeans and so it then starts recommending me products which are um you know not just you know not just uh, just jeans but it also then looks at the variety of products that i purchased and recommends those uh you know the, the variety of products that will help me you know outfitting with offering options and also like provide other ideas of what i can purchase so um the talk is primarily going to be about how we develop this so that it can take into account my real-time browsing behavior and real-time shopping behavior, and then adapt the recommendations to uh, make the customer journey more personalized. Um, and with that, I'd like to get the control back. Um, I think I'm at time, but uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions, but feel free to come. Uh, we'll do at the end. We'll do the uh, okay. uh, questions and answers. At the end, very good presentation, Hello and by the by, in uh, uh, Lake and... Uh, I'm not as versatile or colorful as my previous speaker, Pallav. Uh, I'm a pretty blah person, but I have a lot of good information to share with you. Uh, some of the exciting uh, open source projects uh, that are helping to speed up, you know, some of the uh, data uh, science workflows that the previous uh, gentleman showed, uh, and all that using NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, I work for the community team at OmniSci as a developer advocate. Uh, and now before diving in uh, deeper uh, into uh, GPUs, uh, you know, we, uh, this is a kind of a, a, a graphic that you may have seen because when you have a lot of data, which we clearly do, um, uh, you need more computational power. And in most uh, big data analytics platform, even the ones that have speeded up uh, by using in-memory uh, data processing frameworks like Spark, uh, you know, uh, they're pretty much based on CPU only platforms. Uh, but as you can see from the graphic, the CPU computational capacity is growing only around 20% at best and uh, compared to the 40% growth in data. So that gap is widening year over year. Uh, and also now um, everybody wants to give a good, uh, you know, customer experience as we saw from the previous, uh, you know, um, presentation. And many times uh, the best customer experience comes when you combine it with location intelligence. Uh, now that makes the data from uh, multi-dimensional, right? From just a, a simple table. Now you have additional, you know, supporting data sets. Now more data again. Uh, this would make it even more compute uh, intensive. 
So what is the solution? Uh, now GPUs are constructed differently than CPUs. You know, they actually have thousands of cores and sort of tens of cores in a CPU. Uh, and it, with C GPUs, actually they're able to add more GPU cores every year. Uh, you know, about, uh, so you're able to increase the processing by almost like 40, 50%. And so that way you're able to close that gap. Now, now the next graphic actually will show you that the GPUs, uh, you know, which were uh, primarily uh, developed for rendering graphics, they on a, on a core by core basis actually have less uh, compute capacity. But the fact that you have thousands of cores uh, on any given GPU card, and also you can pack, uh, you know, a number of GPU cards, you can actually go up to like 40,000 cores on a single system. So you can see that over here, you can get like 20 tasks per nanosecond versus 4,000 tasks per nanosecond on a GPU. That is like 200x uh, more work can be done with GPU. Now, in addition to the uh, uh, computational power, uh, GPU also has higher memory bandwidth. Uh, and this is like almost like 50x more than the CPU based uh, you know, memory. Now, the fact that you have more uh, computational power, more uh, higher bandwidth is actually now well known and a lot of the AI and ML practitioners are actually starting to adopt GPU based system uh, as part of their machine learning pipeline. Now, when you have uh, different machine learning pipelines, even if they use GPUs, um, if they kind of are, you know, uh, saving it in their own uh, binary data format, every time you copy or pass this, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this uh, data frame between the different applications, you're going to end up doing a lot of serialization and deserialization. And so a lot of copies and converts. Uh, because of this issue, you kind of lose all the benefit that you just gained by switching from CPU to GPU. Uh, because of this, there is a, uh, an initiative that was started called Go AI, which stands for GPU Open Analytics Initiative. And it was formed to develop a GPU data frame that allows for efficient interchange of data between processes uh, running on GPU. And it uses Apache Arrow in a memory data format. Uh, now Apache Arrow is uh, basically a, a language agnostic uh, columnar in memory, GPU memory format. It, it supports both GPU and CPU and uh, is very well suited for you know, a flat and hierarchical data. Now, the basic approach that was uh, you know, proposed uh, by the GPU data frame is actually uh, quite simple. If all the applications, uh, if they all agree on this common memory format, uh, you can then uh, just pass a device, uh, a pointer to the data structure uh, between the, these applications, so you completely eliminate all the copy and converts. Now, in addition to that, uh, NVIDIA like CUDA driver actually allows the device pointer to be moved uh, between the processes using IPC. So now coming to RAPIDS, uh, RAPIDS is an open source uh, project from NVIDIA, uh, which makes use of uh, Arrow in memory data format, which we just saw uh, as the underlying uh, storage. Now, <clears throat> and uh, to kind of build a data science workflow. Uh, it, it basically covers the full gamut all the way from data loading, data transformation, and uh, data analytics. Uh, now RAPID's uh, project includes uh, CUDF, CUDF, uh, a pandas data frame manipulation library, uh, QML or CUML, a collection of machine learning libraries that provide GPU versions of algorithms that are available in scikit-learn. Uh, a lot of you folks are probably uh, familiar with scikit-learn and use it all the time. Uh, now, KuGraph is a library of graph algorithms that seamlessly integrates into uh, you know, Rapids 
uh, ecosystem and that basically allows you know uh, uh, you to call the graph algorithms uh, using the data that is already stored in the GPU data frame. Now, because it standardizes on the arrow format, you know, data loaded into the, you know, the basically the pandas uh, data frame can then be passed on to uh, CUML or uh, uh, KuGraph, you know, the graphics analytics library. And uh, we know that Python is actually the most popular uh, now, um, uh, uh, you know, language that is used uh, by data scientists. So basically, Rapids provides drop-in replacement uh, Pythonic interfaces for the existing tools. So you really don't have to, uh, you just need to include the library and you'll see that in an example and you'll be able to uh, uh, make use of the Rapids, uh, you know, uh, GPU-based uh, interface. Uh, <clears throat> Now you can go to the rapids.ai uh, um, uh, GitHub and you can get a lot of uh, notebooks uh, that are uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks with these examples. Now, how does OmniSci fit into the Rapids ecosystem? Now, first of all, uh, what is OmniSci? OmniSci is a lightning fast uh, data analytics and visualization platform that harnesses the power of GPUs to interactively explore really large data sets. So when we talk about large data sets, we're talking about multi-billion row tables uh, that you do not have to pre-aggregate or pre-index. I'm sure this must be good news to a lot of uh, uh, folks running SQL on large tables, uh, but you can simply run your SQL as is, you know, without any of that, uh, uh, work and it'll give you your results back in under a second, uh, typically you know hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, now the query results are actually returned in a pandas data frame that is based on the GPU memory and can be passed on to the ML libraries provided by QML. So uh, we we can uh, we can also use the Python APIs. Uh, then after you've done the modeling to push the results back uh, as a separate table on OmniSci. So now in the uh, machine learning workflow, you can create a dashboard with both the historical you know, uh, data layered along with the predicted results. So this actually uh, is really, uh, visualization actually plays a very important role in feature engineering, but this kind of capability where the data stays in GPU throughout your machine learning workflow, and at the same time you can visualize it, is actually very, very helpful. Now, what makes OmniSci uh, so fast? Uh, we actually, uh, uh, clearly, because uh, our speed is, uh, you know, um, we completely harness the GPUs, uh, thousands of cores, um, by uh, kind of optimizing all the SQL analytic operations, uh, so such as like the uh, filtering operation using where or the segmenting operations using group by. Uh, so uh, the SQL query, uh, you know, uh, is really really fast. In addition to that, we use a just-in-time uh, compilation uh, method uh, provided by LLVM. Uh, so this. Uh, not only uh, allows us to run both on GPU and CPU, but also is uh, helpful in kind of uh, optimizing our use of the uh, the GPU uh, memory bandwidth. Now, now in addition to that, because the the data that is uh, queried now is in the GPU memory, we use the graphics pipeline then to render the data. And so this allows us to now render very complex geospatial charts, you know, choroplets and heat maps. We talked about multidimensional nature of data. So we can actually take the location data and we can now, in addition to, uh, we can kind of layer that uh, more from a geospatial view on top of, you know, your, your traditional, uh, histograms and bar charts and line charts. And we use, uh, for the rendering engine, we are basically using the Vega visualization grammar. So you can also create your own custom apps 
to basically uh, create your own charts. You're not kind of married to our uh, user interface layer. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, the high-level architecture uh, diagram. You can see uh, uh, OmniSci consists of three parts. Uh, the core, uh, which supports, uh, which is a columnar database, supports SQL. And, uh, and, and then there's a rendering engine based on Vega and Immerse is our visualization. Uh, OmniSci is not a system of record database. You're actually bringing in data from your existing uh, uh, data sources or warehouses. And, uh, you know, this could be, uh, so you can actually stream it. Uh, we support Kafka, or you could bring it from uh, CSV files, from S3. It could be in, uh, from Parquet data sources. Uh, at the same time, we also provide very rich uh, JavaScript and Python APIs that you can then pull the data. And now, as I explained, you can then feed it into uh, the Rapids, uh, you know, uh, machine learning libraries. Uh, at the same time, you can also take the results and create your own um, uh, customized user interface, or you can pass it on to other BI tools uh, like Tableau or Power BI. Now, I will first go to the uh, other before I, uh, if I have time, I'll show a demo. Otherwise, we'll keep it for the main event. Uh, yeah, we will, we will, uh, yeah, try to close because. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, just uh, three more slides very quickly. Yeah. Uh, very easy to deploy. Uh, you can deploy on as an open source. Um, um, you can go to the GitHub. Uh, we also offer a SaaS. Uh, offering. So you can just go to omnisci.com slash cloud and uh, you get 15 days free uh, uh, GPU in the cloud. Uh, with um, And also there is an enterprise version that you can download as a trial. Uh, PyMapD provides the API to uh, it's basically the Pythonic interface and it allows you to uh, basically uh, go load the table um, you know, and run your queries and do all the data manipulation. And uh, there's an excellent blog. Uh, I'll make this uh, deck available. So you'll, uh, you can read this uh, blog on using PyMapD to load data to OmniSci Cloud. Uh, uh, again, uh, OmniSci uh, is both on-prem, uh, on in the cloud, uh, supports, um, you know, um, <clears throat> okay. All right, uh, some of the next steps, you can go and look at some of our blogs, our demos, uh, and uh, also participate in our community. Thank you. Will you be doing the demo during the present presentation? Oh, absolutely. Uh, peer pressure. I ended up making a few slides for all of you while I was on this call. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, I'll, I'll try and keep it really brief. Uh, looking forward to any questions you guys might have. Uh, later today, and then I'll save the crux for the for the actual event. Um, so I want to kind of talk about customer obsessed approach to build magical customer experience using data science and behavior science, uh, with data being the key thing, which is you know which is the underlying concept on which uh, some of these experiences could be built. Uh, you know, and I think uh, there was a great introduction, so I'll not spend time on this slide. I'll move on to the next one. Uh, so I think I kind of talk about this slide, especially in any uh, summits or conferences that I speak within the Silicon Valley, uh, because I work for Walmart Labs, but I'm uh, well ingrained in a smaller company within Walmart, what we call a Sam's Club. Uh, Sam's Club is a $60 billion warehouse membership based retailer. Uh, and I call it the biggest little startup within Walmart. Because though we are a sixty billion dollar company, you know we are like twelve percent of all of overall Walmart, uh, you know, uh, sales. So we get to we get a lot of uh, leverage because of that. You know, given despite the scale that we have, we still to we still get to act as a startup. Um, so I'll probably spend next couple slides talking about Sam's Club uh, just to kind of uh, paint the picture uh, of who are who we are, uh, what we do. And then I'll get into, uh, you know, uh, how to build customer obsessed products, uh, you know, both in the physical world and in the digital world, if that's okay. 
Okay, so uh, one quick slide uh, to kind of talk about it. Um, I mean, the common theme, and I typically ask the questions, given that this is a, this is a monologue, I'll, I'll, I'll save the question. Uh, I think the key call out that I wanted to make is if Sam's Club was a company of its own, uh, not being part of Walmart, we would have been ahead of all of these companies uh, as per Forbes uh, and Fortune, uh, because we would have been a Fortune 54 company. Uh, so I think I just wanted to kind of ground and talk about, you know, who we are, uh, you know, uh, from a branding standpoint, especially in the Bay Area, since we don't have a lot of clubs here, uh, people may not be aware, but it, that's to kind of just talk about, uh, you know, what is the power of the brand that we have uh, from, a, from a sales and reach standpoint. Uh, in, uh, we are also, uh, you know, as I said, we get to be uh, act, we get to act like a startup and we also get to be more innovative. Uh, we have a number of, uh, you know, innovation that is either already in pilot phase or has been scaled. Uh, we are also actively working on the next wave of innovation as we speak. Uh, you know, as, uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, one of the technologies that I built is also patent pending. So, uh, you know, I can share wh whatever I can uh, within the conference, uh, within the purview of what legal uh, sign off uh, has been given to me. Uh, and I just want to also call out that Sam's Club, you know, uh, recently by Forbes was also named the most innovative retailer in America. Uh, this is a Forbes uh, story. Uh, you guys can go look at it. Uh, uh, and, it and it kind of talks about uh, you know, what kind of innovation we've been doing at what scale and why we've been able to be extremely successful at the pace that we are operating on. So with that, I'll move on to the crux of uh, the topic. So I want to talk about customer ops product building and, I, and I'll kind of, you know, put it within the framework of three questions. Uh, why do we have to be customer ops uh, what are the real life uh, problems that we are, that we solved uh, and how did we solve it, right? So I want to keep it more customer and case studies driven. Uh, I will not talk about case studies today, but what I'll uh, try and do today in the webinar is to paint the picture of what is the approach we take, what is our philosophy, what is the framework we use, how we are able to scale it uh, at the scale that we operate in across 600 clubs and across mobile and digital. And then, uh, you know, and what has been our uh, success criteria uh, that we put our products through so that we've been consistently, you know, able to deliver the right experience. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Any, any questions till now? Yeah, able to hear you. Okay, Go ahead. awesome. All right, okay. So I'll talk about, you know, I call this the framework of, of product acceleration, right? I think uh, why is it important is because uh, obsession to understand the customer needs. And I think a number of other panelists earlier today also spoke about constant feedback and hearing and understanding customer needs uh, being at the central and the forefront. Uh, so with that context, I think, you know, that's the, uh, and what we do is we kind of take it to the heart and we have imbibed customer feedback and customer experience as part of the overall uh, product development and product evangelization uh, process, what we call as product acceleration. Uh, so what, what is product acceleration and why do this? So I'll just kind of, you know, not spend too much time on the slide, but basically what we are saying is we always start with the customer need. Uh, most of the time we get tempted to start looking at business problems or p l issues, or, uh, or we start with a solution, right? And then, you know, uh, and, and it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap, especially, you know, given all the technology innovation which has been happening either within IoT space, big data space, uh, you know, and variable space and all of this, it gets, it gets very easy to get into the trap of, oh, this is a cool solution, this is a shiny solution, let's go figure out where to use it, right? I think the, the what we do is we actually do the opposite. We start with a customer need or a customer problem and then figure out what is the fastest and the cheapest way and the most feasible way uh, to solve this problem and what kind of technologies can we use uh, either which are uh, stable, uh, matured, or even emerging a new tech that we could use to go solve this problem. Uh, then we get together with what I call as experience teams, which includes business operations, technology, design, 
uh, data analytics and product. And uh, we, we align on John priorities and measurement. I think that's the key. I think when, when we start with the customer need, it's extremely important to quantify how are we going to measure success and what does success look like? And then we get into the rapid execution. So the core underlying principle of this is obsession with customer need, clarity of purpose, going through the hypothesis framing and uh, scientific rigor, defining success as I already mentioned, a clear ownership because you know even within Sam's Club and Walmart, you know a normal project that we execute has over 20 teams. So clearly under uh, defining and understanding the scope and uh, ownership is extremely critical. Um, so we kind of take a little bit of time kind of really making it crystal clear and then we go into rapid iteration. But one thing I would like to say is one thing that we follow uh, almost like, um, you know, which is very sacred to us is we, we do what we call as product review, which is a detailed review, which talks about the why, what, how, and the customer need and the measurement and data where we spend a lot of time on the problem space rather than getting jumping into solution space. And we get an alignment there and only then when we start building code. So until the product review is done and it's signed off and aligned, we don't even write a single line of code. And we kind of think that that is very, very critical because tech bandwidth for us is the most expensive and we want to try and optimize and we don't want to build stuff that is not useful. So uh, again, I would say this slide is kind of talks about, you know, we have kind of looked at different problems and I just gave an example. Uh, you know, the idea is, you know, the wonder strikes when there is a mixture of art and science. And I've kind of picked up some of uh, our, the key problems or case studies that we, that I'd be sharing. Uh, but in terms of, you know, why do members renew? What is hyper engaged members look like? What are they buying from us? What do members like dislike? What does value of membership mean? Uh, would they recommend Sam's Club to family and friends? So these are critical, I would say, you know, uh, you know, problems or hypothesis that we have defined that actually connects back to uh, real customer needs uh, that I had initially mentioned about. Uh, and then the core principles of product acceleration is, uh, as I said, starting with customer need, uh, you know, relying on data, making sure everyone who's working on a particular problem has a seat at the table where decisions are made. Uh, focusing on customer NPS uh, is extremely critical. Uh, working as one team, uh, you know, making sure that, the, that we don't have blockers and we are resolving blockers uh, and our SLA to resolve any kind of blocker, whether tech or process or a, or a legal or operations related ones is like six days. We want to make sure a blocker doesn't go on for more than six days. Uh, and then focusing on results and focusing on iteration and speed. Um, and I think we've been able to do that at a massive scale. Uh, because we've been able to move from an IT mindset to a product mindset, uh, you know, uh, serving the needs of the customer, data-driven requirements, uh, you know, prioritization is a key, uh, cross-functional teams alignment, and driving results and iteration. Um, I'll flip through the next slide. So what did we do? I think this is the most interesting part. So these are the case studies that I'm going to share where we have kind of used both a cognitive behavior science from a perspective of psychology, and uh, underlying that is a core data science, uh, you, know, uh, you know, algorithms and analytics that we've been able to draw. And, and combining the two has provided us, uh, you know, uh, provided us ability to go build those magical experiences that I spoke about. So the problems uh, that we had articulated is customers don't like standing in checkout lines. They don't see value in, of membership. They don't see value of higher tier of membership and they don't like finding their favorite items being out of stock. And these are some of the hypotheses. And I think I'll, I'll be spending more time uh, at the event going through each one of these case studies and talking about what role did data play in terms of uh, you know, understanding the problem, defining success, and also even with solution building. And then the second part is you know, what kind of magical experience that we end up building, uh, which actually got recognized by Forbes that I had shown you guys before. And how did we solve real, real life problems? And this is the framework I'm going to be talking about for each of those case studies, uh, uh, trying to answer three, three basic questions. What are the real life problems we are trying to solve? How will we know that we have solved the problems? And how will we test, learn, and iterate? 
to make sure that we uh, the problems that we are solving is actually solving the customer need and the customer problem. Uh, and for most of this, we will have both qualitative and quantitative test results that would show that these problems either have been solved or not been solved. So I'll leave you guys with one teaser. I am also going to talk about one product which actually failed, which I think is very, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting case study, uh, but I leave it at that. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll save the rest for the event. Uh, I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take. Uh, if not, you know, I'll leave it there. Uh, please wait uh, for the questions.